Are we working here? You're right. Uh, greetings. First, uh, two quick announcements. First, uh, I have, we have conferred with our medical advisory team, and given the distance and the vaccination status of both myself and our guests tonight, in the interest of your of audibility and your uh, understanding of what's going on, we, will, we have a clearance not to be masked during the uh, show, and hope that uh, that's, uh, seems acceptable to everyone. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, just to mention, for the undergraduate students in the office, tonight's event um, is the second, actually, event that uh, qualifies if you, on your path to a civics uh, certificate during your years here, um, uh, this will qualify and you can register that in, uh, in a way that will soon be uh, made public to you. The first event was the Senator Sanders event downtown, which some of you may have attended. So either of those qualifies and uh, uh, we hope some of you will take advantage, or are here to take advantage of that. Uh, I hope you were given, as you were to be given, uh, biographies on the uh, man that you're about to meet. He's led multiple lives, any one of which would have qualified him uh, to come here and, and uh, spend time with us. The greatest chess player, perhaps, of all time, certainly of his time. Uh, then um, uh, a, a leader in the short-lived movement for true democracy and freedom in his home country of Russia which perished rather quickly, and then a, a bold and risk-taking, uh, really uh, a courageous dissident in the emerging dictatorship, which continues to rule in that country. And now, uh, to the uh, really great uh, advantage of us all and the world, a leader in the, in the global campaign for human rights and democracy. So uh, uh, those four lives, which may be uh, only the first of, of four great ones that this man leads, uh, make us so grateful to uh, have tonight with us. And I ask you to welcome now for his opening, opening remarks, Gary Kasparov. Good afternoon. Thank you. And my thanks to President Daniels and you all for having me here today to talk about such an important topic. Oh, last night I asked what is a boilermaker. <laughs> and uh, I said I should wait until after my talk tonight to find out. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to it, whatever it is. The title of tonight's conversation might sound um, a little hysterical. Freedom can mean many things, but for most of modern human history, all of those things were positive and desirable. The United States was founded for freedom. Slavery was abolished in the civilized world. World wars were fought to defeat tyranny, the opposite of freedom. Then the Cold War was fought and won. And here we arrive to my area of special interest. I'm a little afraid that in 2021, today, the Cold War might feel as distant to students as the Battle of Waterloo or the Peloponnesian Wars. Wow, he is a real Cold War veteran. Yes, we're still alive. I'm 58 years old, and I've lived under two distinct dictatorships. First, the communist totalitarianism of the Soviet Union, which collapsed in 1991. In 1990, on January 17, my family and I, like many in Azerbaijan of Armenian heritage, were forced to flee violent ethnic pogroms that erupted there. As one of the first prominent Soviets to openly criticize the communist system and demand freedom and reforms, the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, the Iron Curtain 
And finally, the USSR itself, were all called personal freedom, not discarding those principles when this guy or that party is in the office. The problem, of course, is that every side, every politician, says that they're on the side of freedom. And they're trying their best because the other side is trying to take it away. Don't treat politics like you're rooting for a sports team. Passionately cheering for your boilermaker is great. Blindly supporting a political party or politician is a very dangerous path. The road to hell may be paved with good intentions, but compromises on principles are the streetlights. Like so many of my compatriots in the unfree world, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, I greatly admired and envied the United States and what it stood for. I was fortunate to be able to travel for my chess career, if only escorted by KGB agents, just like the Soviet players in, the Queen, in Queen's Gambit. By the way, it was my advice to Scott Frank to incorporate KGB guys that were not in the original book. <laughs> Just, you know, sometimes your experience helps. <laughs> uh, um, I peered around the Iron Curtain and saw the American Republic as a proverbial shining city on a hill. I admit that my view of the West and the US was more than a little uh, rose-colored. I was young and a little naive. But even today, even today, I would like Americans to appreciate what they have. The true beauty of American democracy is that it recognizes it is not perfect. It adapts. The people have a voice in their own system, as unhappy as they might be with it at any moment, especially when the other party is in power. Real elections are a privilege. When I organized the other Russia coalition in 2005, my fellow democracy advocates and I organized party primaries because we wanted the Russian people to have a chance at participating in free and fair elections, unknown in the Putin era. Today, some would-be American authoritarians are passing laws to suppress voting, gerrymind the elections, and allow partisan functionaries to overrule the vote. America's freedom of speech is a privilege. Even as a young world chess champion, I had to guard my actions, my words, even my thoughts in the USSR. Everyone in the Soviet Union, from children to grandmasters, had to censor themselves. In Putin's Russia, even the smallest amount of protest, even just a tweet, just a tweet or retweet can land you in jail. As the saying goes, we do have freedom of speech in Russia, but in America, you also have freedom after speech. <laughs> now that I live in America, I thought I'd never again have to look over my shoulder when speaking in my mind. But today, Far too many people want to constrain public discourse to what is socially acceptable at the moment. This isn't the heavy hand of the state, but any, any chilling effect is a threat to democratic discourse. Democracy may or may not die in darkness, but it certainly dies in silence. Extremists on both political sides are pushing the same dangerous message. American democracy is broken. Well, the other guys are doing it, so we have to do it too. It is a downward spiral. You cannot fight illiberalism with more illiberalism. Partly due to this internal warfare on democratic values at home, America is pulling back from the world stage with catastrophic results. This is also a cycle that feeds on itself. If authoritarianism 
is more or less acceptable in China, in Russia, in Saudi Arabia, in Afghanistan, why not here? The thousands, many thousands of Afghan refugees who have touched down on American soil know the value of freedom because they have seen its absence. For those who believe that the American system is inherently oppressive and irredeemable, just ask any refugee about the alternative. Again, this isn't to say that U.S. is perfect. But to paraphrase Churchill, it's better than anything else, than everything else that have been tried. Every American should appreciate the difference between improving the system, using the system, and attacking the system. Police brutality, for example, is the system in Russia, or in Iran, or in China. And I have a few scars, personal scars, to prove it. Russian police aren't arrested and jailed for attacking protesters or even kill, killing them. They are given medals for good service. Discrimination against minorities is the system in places like Afghanistan by gender, race, and religion. And these victims cannot go to court to defend their rights. Even income inequality, a great crisis of our time, is the system in many places. Some people in these places have the right to riches, while others are permanently excluded from any opportunities at all. Criticize American democracy. It's your right and your duty. But please, do not lose faith in it. Do not say the system is broken every time you lose. Do not press the violation of democratic norms as soon as you win. Once freedom is surrendered, they are never returned without a battle. Freedom has real enemies. They use bombs and they use propaganda. They use the social media technology developed in the free world to spread division and misinformation, to hack and steal. But the greatest threat to our democracy is from within. Freedom has a future if we stop taking it for granted. Freedom has a future if we stop letting the extremes dominate the political landscape. Freedom has a future, I believe it. But we have to fight for it. So let's fight. Thank you. Once again, we are so grateful to have you with us. And thank you for spending this uh, hour and the and uh, the audience should know a full day with our students and faculty and elsewhere on the campus. Very generous of you. Um, a, a predecessor in this uh, series of programs, uh, the, the author and scholar uh, Francis Fukuyama wrote a book just 20 years ago, uh, or so, 25? 28. 28? <laughs> Who counts? Never argue with the Grand Master. <laughs> in any event, um, uh, he, he proclaimed the end of history, the, uh, the final triumph of, of, uh, of individual freedom, of values, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of free exchange, and, uh, and yet uh, here in a historical blink later, we see a very different pattern, not just in your home country, but in so many other places. Freedom House, uh, for the 15th straight year, just found a decline in freedom, yep. Yep. fewer than 20% of the world's population now, they say, living in free societies, what happened? Going back to 1992, 1993, when the book was written and, and released, I have to say that we all shared the sentiment. I remember us celebrating the collapse of the Soviet Union, and before that, the collapse of Berlin Wall. So it's the country after country abolished communism, and uh, you know, we all thought it would be, you know, it would be the end of history. Um, it's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback, you know, now saying, oh, you had to look at this and that, and, and the, you know, there were already some seeds of future failure. But I think what we missed, and this is the hard lesson for us to learn, the evil doesn't die. 
It can be buried temporarily under the rubble of Berlin Wall. But the moment we lose our vigilance, the moment we turn to be complacent, it sprouts out. In Russia, it's, it took nine years. But it's not that Putin came out of, out of the blue. We already saw many moments, you know, just turning, now we know turning points that prepared Putin's appearance, even before we even knew his name. It's, he, he just, you know, he was the, I wouldn't call the right man in the right place, the right time, but that's, you know, because it's exactly the opposite. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, it was the right time to set up dictatorship because the seeds of dictatorship had been planted by many actions that we supported. Yeah, Yeltsin confronted the Russian parliament. And I said, oh, no, Yeltsin is the right guy. Yes, and the, they're, they're wrong guys. Yeah, and he used tanks to, to destroy it. Fine. I was rooting behind Yeltsin. I supported him in 1996. We believed that democracy had been protected because we were afraid of return of communism. What we didn't understand is that democracy is a process, not a result. The moment you go against the process, the moment you accept that your guy, whose best intentions in this world, can violate the rules, can rig the result, a little bit tweak. It started with a little tweaks here and there. That's, that's, that's it. And, uh, and, um, and also, uh, the, it's another problem was on the side of the free world. Because, ironically, at the end of the Cold War, America lost its, its vision of the future. From 1946 to 1991, it was easy. Soviet Union was there, communism, America had to stay, you know, as the, as the force for good, defending the free world against communism and against all sorts of dictators. And, uh, and in 1991, what's next? So it's not surprising that um, Bill Clinton was elected because the country wanted, you know, also wanted the end of history. So it's an, instead of, you know, having a fairly successful Republican president, Bush 41, so they went for a young, optimistic, you know, just guy from Arkansas who just talked about its economy, stupid. So let's, you know, let's celebrate. Let's, you know, let's get rich. So it's, this is, you know, the first bubbles, you know, real estate bubbles. Uh, it's 97, 98, so, and then the, the um, dot-com bubbles. So this is, people got, you know, really excited. Um, and, uh, and it's not... It's not, an, it's not an accident that at the time where Bill Clinton took over in 1990, January 1993, America was all powerful and uh, nobody could even dare to challenge the United States. That, that at the time when he left the office and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Bush 43 moved in, Al Qaeda was ready to strike. So um, it all comes to strategy. So the free world is still struggling with the idea, so what's next? Because the difference between dictatorships and, and, and uh, democracies, if I use chess language or some of my experience about decision making, it's about strategy versus tactics. Uh, democracies could benefit from long-term strategies because they have continuity. That's a strength. So you can have one administration, one government, building up a program, sort of setting up you know, institutions, as Harry Truman administration did in 1946, 1947, basically creating the whole infrastructure to fight this Cold War against Soviet Union. And then you had president after president, Republican and Democrat, following this path, eh, with some, you know, fluctuations, but within the range. Continuity. Dictators, they, they cannot rely on, on continuous uh, uh, programs because it's all about him surviving today. So it's the... But the moment you move from strategy to tactics, dictator has an advantage because he doesn't care about free press, parliament, debates, consensus, boom, decision made. And I think that's, that's in the last 20 years, we're seeing you know, this, this time and again, as the free world it keeps fa kept failing to come up with a plan, with a vision. And that gave an opportunity for all sorts of uh, thugs, dictators, and terrorists around the world because they, they have an upper hand you know, you cannot outperform them if you don't have a long plan that will be, um, uh, will be carried through by your um, successors. And at a time where, you know, uh, American foreign and domestic policy depends exclusively on who is in the White House. And instead of being, you know, steady, just a little bit, you know, just it's, uh, you know, off, off more of a steady line, it's now more like a pendulum. It goes one side or another. And uh, it's not only hurts America domestically, but also it hurts America internationally because people don't know what to expect. Granted, the importance of, of strategy and everything you just said, 
um, this, uh, this uh, reversal has been so sweeping across the world in societies of all kinds. I want to ask you about culture as a, as a prerequisite for democracy and freedom. In a very idealistic way, um, the president who followed Bill Clinton, for example, proclaimed that freedom is a, a universal impulse of the human part, heart. Once uh, given the uh, opportunity, uh, peoples of all kinds would, would migrate to free institutions. Others have said that was naive, and maybe recent events suggest it was, that there are societies that aren't prepared, don't, don't understand. Did Russia understand what genuine freedom, uh, both economic and political, was? And did other countries that have gone the other way? Um, that's a very dangerous proposition that some of the nations, uh, some of the groups, genetically um, not built to... Uh, well, not genetically, uh, historically. That's, it's genetically, by the way, so that's this, yeah. <laughs> it's just historically, that's, you know, the, it's, it's an easy bridge, so that's this, is, yeah. yeah that let's, go, let's go to the root, because okay. that's, that's how we, yeah, yeah, it's historically, but what me, yeah. historically, so that's, that's yeah. yeah. Um, but the good news is that the history of the 20th century refuted, convincingly refuted this argument. Because it's not I say, you say, they say, somebody says. It's, it's no longer a theoretical dispute. We had situations of divided nations that have been divided by, in half. Korea, in 1953, it was divided by half. They had the same you know, um, starting conditions. You look at the North. Northern Korea is one of the most oppressive regimes ever. And looking at the North, you say, oh, Koreans, they don't know how to, how to enjoy democracy. They just, they, they're born to be slaves because they have their dear leader, you know, one, and then another one, and now this is a grandson, and it goes forever. And you'll be right. You look south, and you'll find out one of the most vibrant market economy and liberal democracies in the world. Yeah, it's just, it's quite successful. Unlike many other developed countries, it didn't manage to, you know, to impeach president and, and put the head of the largest corporation in jail for corruption. Just the same Koreans. If you point out at China, saying, oh, wow, look at this Chinese people. They succeeded. They, they took millions, hundreds of millions, out of poverty, thanks to the Communist Party. Yes, but look at the other side of the strait, at the tiny rocky island called Taiwan. The same Chinese people had conditions that are much, 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 much better, one of the most developed democracies and market economies in the world. So, and, and I don't even mention two Germans. Hmm. And by the way, this is, it's, it's speaking about Russia, because you mentioned Russia. Hmm. I know there's, there's definitely some people that's with Ukrainian roots here in the audience. Yeah, I, I already could see this, you're nodding your heads. I met some of you this morning. You know what is the... The Soviet Union is just one state, so the, the borders between republics were nominal. So when you look at the border between what was proper Russia, Russian Federation, and Ukraine, so the border was almost non-existent. You had people living on one side or another side. Um, you had people living in Belgorod or Kursk, for instance, that's Russian geography, or Kharkov on the other side, on the Ukrainian border. They all spoke Russian predominantly Russian, so the Ukrainian side spoke very little Ukrainian. It was Russian-dominated area. They read the same newspapers. They watched the same movies. But Putin failed to march triumphantly across eastern Ukraine. All he got is this is truncated part of Donbass, because many Ukrainians who he believed would be supportive of his, you know, of his uh, aggression, they didn't want to live in Putin's Russia. Mm -hmm. They spoke Russian, but they were not uh, comfortable of becoming part of Putin's Russia. Let me so, ask you and about what this one, this oh, is the, and what the difference, what was the difference? You know, this is, again, it's about conditions. In 1994, I believe that Russia and Ukraine, so they parted their ways. Because in Russia, we thought preserving Yeltsin is everything. In 1994, Ukraine had a historic event. The president, Kravchuk, lost elections and walked away. That was a peaceful transition of power, and that's made a great difference. 
So, and Ukrainians always responded to any attempts of thugs like Yanukovych to take over and just, you know, to turn Ukraine into something like Russia. So, again, it's this, there are no, there's no genetic predetermination. So, though I have to say that it's much easier to build democracy in the countries that had some traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it, 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 it takes less, you know, less time and efforts. So that's why in many Eastern European countries, so we saw, we saw it as a quite very quick transition. Though you look at countries like Hungary, it's just the, the liberalism, you know, could also find roots, even in a country with such a long and uh, uh, fertile history of democratic traditions. Tell us, uh, teach us a few things about uh, your man Putin. Uh, My man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I could get your a rise out of you. Okay. That um, uh, uh, what are, uh, how do you assess his uh, motives? It can't be money. He's now one of the wealthiest people on the planet. Um, what is is it one? Is, sorry? You said one of the wealthiest. Okay, maybe number one. Uh, he, uh, uh, is it revanchism? Does he want to rec recreate the, uh, himself as czar? Is it revenge for uh, the, what happened to his uh, beloved Soviet Union? Uh, what, uh, what's, his, what's his game? What's his, uh, what are his aims? No, I think right now his only aim is to stay in power. Uh, now, what were his motivations from the very beginning? It's hard to say. We can just look at some of his interviews and the book, that one book that, you know, this, that was a long interview that he did before officially elected President of Russia, being already Yeltsin's successor. So, and uh, following what he said, again, when he was still open for journalists, not for, you know, the propaganda functionaries. So his original motivation was money. He wanted to be an oligarch, his words. So, but at the same time, he had this KGB uh, dreams about restoring the great Soviet power. Mm. So you just following what he said, and which we can try to compose this some kind of psychological portrait. In 1999, being a prime minister and Yeltsin's already designated successor, he spoke to um, his former colleagues at Lubyanka, at the, it's the KGB headquarters. And he made it very clear, you know, before, you know, just he, he, he started his talk, that he was, uh, no, he was on his uh, special um, uh, mm, uh, mission in the government, representing his alma mater. <laughs> uh, and he said, quote, unquote, in Russian, there are no former KGB officers. One KGB is always KGB, quote, unquote. Mm. That's the... Now, he also said, as this newly sworn president of Russia, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, quote, unquote. His first, or one of the first acts as president was to restore Soviet anthem. For me, that was enough to, to get worried. I knew, you know, we would be landing in Russia because I knew that I would be arrested. Um, or worse. Okay, let's say arrested first. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, they started investigation of our, you know, of our rallies. And by the way, I have to say proudly that, you know, in all demonstrations that we had in Russia, in the rallies from 2005 to 2012, when I was there, we did not have a single act of violence from our side. We did not have a single broken window. Don't even mention burned cars. The only violence in the streets of Russia came from Putin's riot police and Putin's intelligence officers. We were always, you know, just we preached non-violence non and we, 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 we managed to stick to that. It didn't, it didn't work out. So, and, um, and they, you know, they were afraid of this, of this massive demonstration. So they, in 2013, they opened investigations and many of my friends and allies so ended in jail or killed. So, and thanks God most of us are in exile now. But it's, it's, there's, no, there's no room for opposition. So this Alexei Navalny was, you know, well known. Yeah, this, this when he, he was nearly poisoned, I mean, nearly killed by poison uh, and uh, trans transferred to Germany and, and his life was saved, you know, Angela Merkel visited him. And he thought, oh, maybe I'm just, you know, I'm so well known. They would not touch me. He came back. Mm. They, didn't, they don't care. And the reason they don't care, because Putin knows that nobody cares. Because he knows that the words of condemnations 
they, he, they, he, he hears from American or European politicians, they're just mere words. At the end of the day, it's all about money. Who cares about German sanctions, quote unquote, on Russia, Russian companies after Crimean, Crimean annexation, if Germany doubled, at least doubled the amount of Russian gas it's buying since 2014? Money talks. And Putin knows that he's in business. And moreover, he proved that he could buy top tier Western politicians. You know, it's just, KGB Lieutenant Colonel now has at his disposal, at his, working for him, former Chancellor of Germany, former Prime Minister of France, and it's a long list. I can, can go on. Um, we, we saw some very large, uh, more recent demonstrations, uh, which al also came uh, to naught in Hong Kong. Were you surprised? And um, Dictators learn from each other. Yeah. Who cares? Oh, condemnation, big deal. Mm. So China is still, you know, it's the more than welcome. So should we start counting U.S. companies that are just, you know, are not just doing business, increasing their business in China? And European Union that doesn't care about America, strong words from the White House, whether they come from Trump or Biden mm -hmm. about China. So at the end of the day, you know, China is in business and they know that uh, uh, America and Europe are politically too weak and indecisive to take a stand, to take a stand for the values. So that's why it's an open genocide in, 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 in Xinjiang. I don't hear anyone, you know, demanding the, okay, I hear some people demand the boycott of Beijing Olympics. You want to bet on that? Hmm. I don't, I wouldn't bet my, my bottom dollar on, on, on this outcome. Uh, so, and as long as there are no consequences, dictators used to uh, just ignore the words. So it's the, yeah, big deal. Um, and, uh, and Putin learned, you know, that uh, uh, the West was uh, weak and politically indecisive to take a stand. By the way, you know, it's, this, it's, it's always, you know, it's always, you know, this, it's, there's also a moment where you can actually do something at, at a cost. And you think the cost is too high. The problem is, next day, the cost goes higher. Hmm. I remember that this is in 2000, uh, it was long, I think it was, I'm not sure, probably, yes, it, it, it's, I'm not sure whether it was after annexation of Crimea or, yeah, maybe, and I had an interview just, um, it's maybe even before, uh, with a Canadian journalist. And I talked about, you know, this is about you know, Russia and Nazi Germany, and she got so angry. She said, how on earth you can compare Putin to Hitler? I said, what's wrong with that? No, Hitler was an ultimate evil. I said, wait a second. Hitler was ultimate evil eventually. But in 1933, 1934, in 1935, in 1936, read your newspapers. Read your Canadian newspapers, New York Times, Le Monde, uh, um, uh, uh, London Times. They treated him with respect. Yeah, this is some problems with Jews. Who doesn't have them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, some problems with, you know, with political opposition. But the man helped Germany to revive. It's not me, it's them. Up to 1939, they were looking for ways of, of, of cooperating. Oh, by the way, in this country, Hollywood, since 1934, agreed for German, German um, general counsel in Los Angeles to censor American movies before they enter the European market. And this happy co co uh, cooperation continued until 1940. You can check the facts. So business, uh, by the way, most of these uh, um, studios were run by Jews. Big deal. So dictators never ask why. They ask why not. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Putin is the same. So this is, he, he looked around, he tried. He was not you know, immediately attacking Ukraine. His first attack was against Estonia cyber attack in 2007. Nothing happened. Then he made a speech in Munich. At the, at the, actually, I think the speech was even before. He made a speech in Munich uh, at, at, at the conference of security conference in Europe. And he talked about spheres of influence. Bush and others, they just, ah, they big deal. It's for domestic consumption. Mm -hmm. Then there was attack on Georgia, Republic of Georgia in 2008. And I wrote an article saying next would be Ukraine. People ask me, how did you know? I said, I looked at the map. <laughs> yeah. that's, I, yes, I don't have the rocket, be a rocket scientist. I just look at the map. And that's it, next would be Ukraine. Yeah. So, but Ukraine was not, you know, just immediately following what convinced Putin that the West would say and do nothing. Syria, 2013, Assad used chemical weapons. And there was a red line. 
Obama wasn't sure, Europeans were, ah, no, don't, don't do that. America stopped short mm -hmm. from, you know, punishing Assad for using chemical weapons and putting you, that's it. So nobody would lift a finger to, um, to, help, um, to help Ukrainians. And uh, now we have already a third, third administration that is yeah, paying, to my view, lip service. Perhaps the other great uh, trend of the last two, three decades has been the uh, onrush of information technology constantly evolving and being enhanced. Uh, much of that was born at this university. A high percentage of our students are studying it, will be its leaders tomorrow. Is, is the, te are the, are the tools we have created, um, many at the, at the beginning heralded them as uh, tools of liberation. They would, they would empower individuals and small groups and allow them to connect in new ways. And yet others have said, no, 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 1984, it'll be the, the tools of, these will be the tools of, of domination and uh, social control. Uh, which view do you hold? There's no answer, both. Technology can be used for good or evil. But we should not worry about technology or, or Terminators ruining our lives. <laughs> Humans still have monopoly for evil. AI, whatever it is, is not a magic wand, but it's not the Terminator. It's not a harbinger of utopia or dystopia. It's a tool. It doesn't pave, you know, our road to heaven, but it doesn't open the gates of hell. It's how we use it. And... Um, um, on one side, it helps dictators. And by the way, it's, it's any technology that we designed, you know, in the past, you know, its first use was always destructive. Because it's easier. It's easier to destroy than to build. It's easier to build nuclear bomb than nuclear reactor. It's just, those are the rules. And of course, now dictators, they were happy because they, they had these, these tools. But at the same time, these tools empower us. It's just uh, each of us carries in pocket or in the purse device which is 10,000 times more powerful than the entire computing power of NASA in 1969 when Americans land on the moon. You can hardly imagine you know, how these people could do that. So probably the reason they did it, because they couldn't calculate the risk. <laughs> because any computer would tell you that the risk was 25, 30% or so, and no US president would have authorized the, the, the mission. So, um, and, uh, and we have this, you know, these great, great opportunities. And again, it's, it's, an, it's a never-ending battle, sword and shield. So this is, we just have to make sure that it works for us because it will be always trade-off. It's, it's, it's what in balance. When people say, oh, look, the AI kills so many good jobs, white-collar jobs. And by the way, technology always destroys jobs. You go back to, you know, to 18th century and this agriculture. Where are these agricultural jobs? They've gone. What about manufacturing jobs? They've gone. So many blue-collar jobs have been destroyed over the 20th century because of technology. So now the difference is that the technology is threatening jobs, uh, white-collar jobs of people with uh, college degrees and Twitter accounts. So all of a sudden, you know, we, we, are, we are really concerned about it. But, you know, it's, it is, again, it, there will be all these trade-offs. You, you have jobs lost in, let's say, radiology because, you know, AI does a better job. But the, 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 uh, the flip side is that it reduces the cost of the procedure, which makes it more, you know, available for other people, not only in this country, but in the world. So again, as humanity will always win, though it's not, you know, it's not win-win. So they're always losers, but I don't want to sound callous, you know, at the end of the day. I was the first man, first professional, who had his job threatened by a machine. <laughs> so, um, I, I just, you know, I, I didn't take it, you know, lightly, but uh, I realized that it was not a curse, but a blessing, because I understood that instead of fighting back, we have to find a way to collaborate. One of our faculty uh, wrote me today to, to remind me that his calculation is that the uh, Big Blue was uh, uh, given a million times more energy than the human brain had. He said if Kasparov had had a million times more, he'd have beat him in... But this, look, but this is the look. Um, 
Uh, by the way, just to do for the record, so I won the first match. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, but it's, you hear time and again that the match in 1997, so was this sort of dawn of uh, AI, artificial yeah. intelligence. I mean, look, I mean, Deep Blue was not intelligent. Right. It was as intelligent as your alarm clock. A very expensive one, $10 million piece. <laughs> but it was not intelligent. It did not have to be intelligent. You know, we should, you know, we should not uh, be mistaken by, by our demand for machines to be perfect. It's not about perfection, it's about making fewer mistakes. So we just should recognize that, you know, machines will never reach perfection. It doesn't exist in, the, in this universe. But machines will help us to minimize our failures. So Deep Blue was good enough to capitalize on my mistakes. Now, if you have your chess engine, I spoke to this chess uh, uh, enthusiast uh, uh, today. So I suggest that you look at the games we played in 1997, Deep Blue versus World Champion. And you put, you put these games on your chess engine, like Stockfish, on your laptop. Every 30 seconds, you'll be hearing machine laughing. <laughs> and by the way, if you have a chess app on your mobile device, it's probably as good as the blue, if not better. I want to ask you one more question, then we're going to go to our, 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 some students for a, a lightning round of questions that they brought uh, to wrap up. But uh, your, your project, uh, your, one of your projects, the Renewed Democracy for All, it's fascinating to read about the various um, uh, programs you have there. I was especially interested, though, that uh, one, two of them actually had to do with artists and the role of art in, uh, in uh, dissent and the role of art in, I, I gather, promoting freedom. Could you just say a word about that? Because... Uh, um. I think it's an underappreciated... Yeah, it's more like a global, you know, human rights project, so by, run by Human Rights Foundation, and uh, we have a special um, uh, award called Václav Havel Prize for Creative Dissent, because he was the first chairman of the organization. And, uh, and I, uh, um, I think it's quite important, you know, just to encourage people to, to use art, mm -hmm. what's this, their creativity, uh, protesting against dictatorship. Because dictatorship, by definition, they hate creative people. Because creativity means you're looking for something new, something that was not tested before, and dictators hate it instinctively. They understand that any attempt to bring something new threatens you know, their total control of the society, of every aspect of our, uh, uh, of our life. Um, and, uh, and we had, uh, um, every year we had um, so many applications. So we, we give three awards, and they just you know, went to people from Africa, Asia, Latin America, uh, uh, former Soviet Union. So this is, yeah, it's, uh, because the, the principle of, of our organization is just simple. We, we look at the human rights abuses, and, and we, 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 we try to be helpful, no matter when it, where it happens, whether it's being conducted by American friends or false. So it's, we, we don't see any political, you know, um, uh, it's, 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 we are politically blind, so yeah. this is, it's all about human rights and about people that are trying to find a way to express their protest. Because, you know, protesting, you know, just uh, doing, you know, some kind of caricatures. In America, it's, it's business, so, mm -hmm. and it's just, you're being, oh, if you're good, if you're successful, you'll be well paid. If you're successful doing caricatures in Turkey, no. you may end up in jail, so mm -hmm. it's the, it's the, there's a classical joke, actually. This, it's, it's a latest Turkish version, but this is, you heard it in many other countries, when it's the, someone in prison, just one of the prisoners asking, you know, for the book in the library, and the director says, sorry, we don't have the book, but we have the author. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank, thank you to uh, some students who have joined us tonight and to the faculty who uh, recruited them. Uh, and uh, uh, your questions, please. Josh, please, first. Uh, so with how, with how polarized our politics are today, especially in America, how do we break through that partisanship um, with a pro-democracy message? Um, look, it's, as I said, you know, it's, the, uh, uh, it's about protecting the process. I think that's something that is now is in great danger. Because, you know, you can lose, you can win. In free and fair elections, whatever happens. But the problem is now that it's, it's, uh, it's not looking for win-win, 
but it's more like, you know, my way highway. And, uh, and I, I'm really worried that you see on one side people saying, oh, this is, we lost, election rigged. On the other side, you say, oh, we won, so we have to rig the, rig the system just to make sure we will we, we win next time. So I think it's, again, it's very important that you find common ground. You don't have to agree on some explosive issues, on taxes or Second Amendment, but you have to protect the framework that allows you to debate these issues. I think that right now, this framework is in great danger because it's this both sides trying to win, even with a minimal majority, but just to, to, to make sure to bend the system that it will, it will work in, 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 just in, in their favor. And, um, and um, I think that these debates these days, they are, just, they are not about means, but they're about common purpose. You look at the old debates, you know, starting with Nixon Kennedy in 1960, these debates were about means how to reach common goals. Even if the debaters were quite polarized by, by their political beliefs, but they were Americans, and, uh, and they didn't argue about, about America, America's democracy. Right now, there's no, there's no common ground, even, you know, just talking about some most fundamental things that made, uh, that made America what it is today. I want to say made America great, but then they decided that would be, <laughs> it would be mis misinterpreted. <laughs> I'm delighted that one of our uh, student questioners that comes to us from Strasbourg, France, Alicia. Okay, so my question is relating to the Human Rights Foundation and also to uh, COVID-19 in general, and it goes as follows. In what ways has the Human Rights Foundation been affected by or has had effect on different governmental legislations caused or affected by COVID-19? Oh, COVID-19 has changed our lives. So we, many of us lost our loved ones, and obviously, you know, we all had to pay the price by, you know, staying in lockdown for, for, for many months. Um, so it's a, I stayed just 10 consecutive months in Croatia in our summer house, but we had to stay there. Just, it was much better than New York. And, uh, in our, yes, it was the first three months of lockdown, New York, and then we relocated to Croatia, so with my wife and kids, and, um, and I just figured out that is, I never stayed 10 months in the same place without flying since 1975. So that was a new experience, uh, though I enjoyed very much, you know, this is, you know, this, the, the sense of family, so I could spend a lot of time with my kids, and, you know, just, it's, uh, never had this opportunity before. Um, now, but, uh, but the, the virus you know, caused a lot of political call challenges, uh, both in the free countries and unfree countries. Uh, but let's not forget that this, the, if, if Chinese government uh, would be open with, with, with the problems that they, they, uh, they um, had to deal with, and I don't think in December, there's more and more evidence that the real problem started in September, October, uh, to, to, to 2019. And of course, it came out of the lab, and not to forget about wet markets. So if they didn't try to hide it, we could probably have saved millions and millions and millions of lives and prevent pandemics, and actually to work on, 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 on antidote much, much sooner. It's, 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 you may call it ironic or tragic, but on January 23rd, the day that China closed Wuhan, at the press conference of WHO, World Health Organization, at Davos, World Economic Forum, they didn't talk about COVID. Insane. Hmm. So, um, um, dictators, of course, used it, but it's, the, it's a double-edged sword. Yes, you know, they want to impose more restrictions, but COVID might be, might be a deadly virus for Putin's regime, because it proved that Russian healthcare system has been broken. So, Sometimes crises, you know, um, create, I wouldn't call opportunities, but, you know, this, like an, it's an opener. And uh, while, you know, Russia is, has been greatly suffering from, from COVID, and the, 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 the numbers of excessive uh, uh, deaths is just, you know, it's yet to be counted. So I lost my mother and a few other relatives uh, who stayed in Moscow. Um, and, uh, um, and the regime proved to be, you know, incapable to, to, 
come up with a comprehensive strategy. They had a vaccine, which I don't think it's, it's a proper vaccine, but uh, they forced people to get to, to, to be vaccinated. But two days ago, where Putin now announcing that he would go to, he had to quarantine again. So after, you know, was everybody being yeah. vaccinated. Um, so I think it's, you know, overall, it's in balance. It's, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, while virus came from China, the, the, the antidote came from America. So it, it's, it's here in the free world where the, anti, uh, the, the vaccine had been, had been developed. Uh, but um, it's yet for us to understand all the consequences. So what I think it's important is to remember that we will be dealing with many crises like this in the future. And it's very important for us not to, not to um, sort of mitigate the risk. So this is because for so many years, for decades, you know, the big pharma companies, they uh, stopped or just they cut short the um, funds to support uh, the research of vaccines and antibiotics because it was too risky. Because the, the chance of, of, of a failure, it was way, way uh, uh, above the, the, uh, the, the numbers allowed by FDA. And uh, the crisis, the COVID crisis, forced these companies to actually to um, uh, increase the risk territory from 0.1% to 20%. And we saw, we saw the outcome. So, and by the way, also, it's, it's, it tells us that if we had less time spent on debating the value of AI and, and, and uh, robots and driverless cars, how many lives could be saved as well? So, so it's, a, it's a message for the free world. We have to move forward. And uh, I'm, again, while, you know, I'm, I'm, I have my own personal wounds of the past, you know, was related to COVID, I still think it's, a, it's, it's, an, you know, it's an important wake-up call for humanity that, you know, we, we cannot stop. So we, can, we, we should continue our exploration. Maybe it's quite symbolic that during COVID years, we had uh, one of the greatest uh, breakthroughs in the space exploration. Again, maybe it's, it's, it tells us that, you know, um, things should move forward. And by the way, one of the alumni here was this Neil Armstrong. Olivia. Hi. Um, so my question for you is relating to um, the Renewed Democracy Initiative. My question really is what drew you in America, because you know, you do hail from another country and you do have ties in other countries. What made you realize our democracy needed that renewed initiative that you've worked so hard on? Um, uh, as I said in my remarks, so I uh, never expected, you know, me just, you know, uh, uh, lecturing or even, you know, Americans or even sharing my experience. But what I saw in America is just, you know, was, you know, quite um, um, frightening because, um, you know, if you, gr if you grow up in a country, in a free, in a free country, so you take many things for granted. You think it's there because, because it's there. So it's just, it's, uh, for decades, it was there with my mother, with my father, with my grandparents. So it's, the, yeah, America had problems, but we always knew that, you know, we had elections, every four years we elect a new president. And now what I saw, and I wrote about it in 2015 and 2016, that so many things that Americans took for granted, they were based on the spirit of the law, not on the letter of the law. And that means that if you had someone arrogant and uh, resolute enough to challenge it, they're saying, sue me. Yeah, I don't want to release my taxes. Oh, everybody else did. So what? Oh, nobody did. Big deal. Sue me. So um, I think now we recognize that, you know, this is this, so many things in American political system had to be codified because we have new challenges. The problem is, you know, in, with this polarization, it's very difficult to, 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 to um, find a compromise. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm so worried. Because you need to make sure that, you know, this is the uh, American elections will not be always about choosing the lesser evil. It will, it will build some sort of, uh, of fortress against, against illiberalism, whether it comes from one side or another. And uh, right now, I think it's, it's the, the overall climate is not, um, is not welcoming this, this um, uh, um, uh, this, this, this plan, the reform plan. Because 
while the foundational values are there, and I believe they just, you know, they are they're solid, and the political system, you know, that has been designed 200, nearly 250 years ago, 240 years ago, uh, is, 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 you know, um, offered so the best algorithm known in the world. Again, it's not a perfect one, but it's the best that we, we, we ever saw built in, on, on this planet. Um, it still has, it always needs to be um, refreshed because you have new challenges. We live in the 21st century, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, arguing about certain amendments in the Bill of Rights, but technology makes certain corrections. So we just have to recognize that we just have to, you know, compromise because, you know, in 1787, you know, you could kill one person, you know, from your, with your Kentucky rifle, and then it would take, you know, what, a minute to reload. Today, you can kill probably 500 people in one minute. So, I'm, I'm for Second Amendment, but I just believe that, you know, you have to recognize there's certain limitations there mm -hmm. that you have to impose. And, by the way, it's just a long, it's a long list. It's a long list of things that require, you know, us to rethink, because it's 2021, for God's sake. <laughs> with all due respect to founding fathers, they didn't know about the Internet. So, we just, you know, we have to deal with these challenges and find a way not, but not to throw away these, the, 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 the values but actually how to modernize them, how to make them, you know, more, you know, to, as I say, adjust. I refrained from asking a chess question, not because I wasn't curious, but because I wasn't competent to. But happily, we have someone who is uh, able. Oh, yeah, you have plenty of them. Yeah, yeah I yeah. saw them. Well, yeah. this is the, there are dozens and dozens of them. There's so many of them, <laughs> you couldn't find one audience to fill them all. I just want to say I very much enjoyed watching you play uh, Chess 960 last week. I wanted to ask, it seems like uh, standard classical chess is disappearing more and more and being replaced by either Rapid and Blitz or Chess 960 or other variants uh, to reduce draws. Do you think that that's called for and um, how do you think the right way to proceed with formats and, and top level chess is? Look, it's the, it's, it, I don't think the classical chess, you know, the, the way we used to play it, you know, was in its opening position. I don't know, what's, what's, the, what's the number, you know, in 960 chess? It's 518 or just, you know, there's the one that we play. So um, it's, it's not going to disappear. But it's more like, you know, view it like, you know, in music. It's a classical opera. What, it represents, what, one or two percent of the music played around the world? But it's still there. And you know that those are the highest standards. So, um, and, uh, uh, and as for 960, it's, it's entertaining. But, you know, you look at Norway chess, the, the, the results today. There were three games, all decisive games. Uh, this is this. I, I think that, again, the, the rumors about the death of classical chess, they are just exaggerated. So I, I still think that there's a lot, of, a lot the game can offer. And at the end of the day, it's not about perfect game. It's about who, who won or lost. And um, I, I still enjoy, enjoy watching it. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's this, people are, we're all humans. We all make mistakes. So that's why it's, it's even if you have the, all, the, you know, all the moves you know, prepared in the opening, you know, checked with a computer, you still have to make a few moves on your own. <laughs> uh, our final questioner, uh, fittingly enough, Sasha Marcone. So my question relates to what you briefly covered earlier. So currently my grandparents live in, U in Kiev, Ukraine, and my great-grandpa lives in Donbass. Life for him is hard, he's 95 years old, and they rarely see each other and have rarely seen each other at all since the start of the war. My grandpa, he's scared to travel east because of a fear of not returning. But it seems like in Western news, you don't really hear about this. Ever since 2014, it's been silent. So what can be done to highlight the situation in the east and to put enough pressure on Putin to abandon his goal of keeping and increasing his territorial gains? So you're talking about Putin and Ukraine? Yes. <laughs> um. As I said, every dictator doesn't ask why, it's why, about why not. And uh, it's, it's about the cost that he will have to pay for further aggression against Ukraine. Uh, he does not want to stop because that's, you know, it's, you know every dictator needs enemies. And, and uh, you always have to offset your domestic failures by so-called geopolitical triumphs. So domestically, he doesn't expect any improvements. Things are getting worse, which 
if we trust history knowledge, uh, always made dictators more hungry, hungrier for foreign adventures. Ukraine naturally is the first target because the Baltic states are still not members of NATO. Crossing the Estonian border, which by the way, I don't think you know, it's, it's out of question. Creating some sort of uh, collision in the Russian-speaking uh, uh, eastern part of Estonia or Narva, possible. Just checking the NATO resolve. Um, mm. But of course, Ukraine remains, you know, obsession. Because that's, you know, that's a very important part of Putin's vision of the Russian world. Uh, I don't think that right now we are, you know, we can say that he would never cross the border. I would say it's, I don't, I don't want to give you 50-50, 60-40, but it's definitely not slim to none. The, uh, he still he has his eye on Ukraine, and, uh, and I think it's, um, it's, it's very dangerous because the free world showed very little desire, no political will to, to, to uh, defend, defend Ukraine or to make Putin pay for that. Um, recently, a couple of weeks ago, President Zelensky visited the United States and met President Biden. So it's, uh, it's quite amazing that just before Zelensky's trip to America, Angela Merkel went to Moscow and then to Kiev. So I don't know if she's looking for a job now in Gazprom, <laughs> because that's, you know, that's serving as a messenger, you know, for Putin. Just, it's, that's, but you never know. So it's just, I always say I would like to see her Stasi dossier, just to understand some of, some of her latest moves, you know, that's, that played so much in the Putin hands. But even Zelensky's uh, conversation with Biden, despite all the declaration from Biden and Blinken and, 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 and Secretary Austin about America being fully behind Ukraine, eh, you look at the amount of help that America offered to Ukraine, it's better than nothing but it's not going to, to, to help Ukraine if Putin moves in. I, I, I had a very sad joke on Twitter that if America you know, uh, offered Ukraine the same amount of weapons they left for Taliban, Putin would run for cover. <laughs> <laughs> well, our, uh, thank you very much to our student um, questioners for a great set of questions. Thank you, of course, for your generosity of time and, and wisdom with us. Uh, we are at the end of our hour, but I move to ask you one last uh, question. Another of your predecessors uh, visiting us here, Madeleine Albright, once described, and that evening described the United States as the indispensable nation. Are we still? I don't vote here, but I want to believe it is. But people like me, we want you to be an indispensable nation, but it's up for you to decide. So you, you have uh, many elections in the last uh, 15 years that um, move the country in the opposite direction. Whether it's Democrat or Republican you vote for, so it seems that you know, the, the message was that America was tired of its global role. And uh, what you can learn and what we saw in Afghanistan as the latest you know, demonstration, that there, were, there, were, there was no and there is no vacuum. The moment you leave, somebody else gets in. And we know who gets in. Putin, Chinese communists, Taliban, thugs, dictators, terrorists. I know Americans are tired of America being the world policeman. Try to live in a city without a policeman on the beat. So that's, um, I, uh, the world is, is getting smaller. It's globalization. But globalization means that, you know, you are no longer protected by two oceans. You should remember that 20 years ago on this tragic day of September 11, 19 terrorists killed more Americans than the entire Japanese fleet at the Pearl Harbor 20 years ago. Now, of course, they have even more means of doing harm. So um, thinking that, you know, I, we walk away and we save, mm -mm. we are, it's, 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 it's a never-ending conflict. That's a history of our civilization. And uh, America still has power, uh, both economically and, 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 and militarily, uh, but it's lacking political will to lead the world and to offer the vision for the future. I, you know, I grew up, you know, with my mother telling me, and it was just, you know, it's a, 
like a billboard on top of my bed, if not you, who else? If it's not America, no one is going to lead the world. So you decide. Gary Kasparov, you've led uh, multiple lives of, of greatness, and uh, you've uh, graced us with your, uh, your presence and, your, and, your, uh, and sharing your time and, as I said, your, your wisdom and knowledge with, this, with us today. Thank you for all those lives and for a great day here at Purdue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.